Hello, uh, my name is Liam Gallagher. I'd like to thank the organizers for, of Bioconference Live for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm actually calling from um, a very wet Ireland uh, in Dublin. Uh, so hopefully uh, the weather in your respective locations is a bit better. So I'm going to talk today really about the use of antibody-based proteomics and digital pathology to fast track molecular diagnostics, particularly in the oncology setting. And in terms of my affiliations, I'm a, an, I have an ad academic appointment within University College Dublin. And I also uh, spun out a company called Oncomark, which I'll briefly mention towards the end, which is focused on molecular diagnostics. So if you look at, um, I suppose, across different therapeutic areas, we have a problem in the area of oncology in the sense that most of the drugs which are used in oncology are pretty ineffective. And there's a, a big issue in terms of variability of patient responses. So this problem really also represents an opportunity within the area of personalized medicine in the fact that can we identify particular biomarkers that can actually be used to stratify patients for appropriate therapies. And there's also another driving force behind this in the sense that it's predicted by 2020 that most medicines will be uh, paid on the basis of results. So if you look at cancer, we know that it's a, an enormous problem and it's growing, uh, obviously, with the aging population. Uh, given that cancer is an age-related disorder, we're seeing a huge increase in the incidence of cancer. Now, we've made a lot of progress in terms of uh, uh, treat, treating certain types of cancer, but there's still an issue in terms of uh, effective utilization of therapies. And again, from a, 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 both a, a medical but also a commercial perspective, this area of molecular diagnostics, particularly in oncology, is a huge growth area. A good example of this is uh, in the area of melanoma. So uh, very recently, in the last few years, we've identified uh, specific uh, mutations, for example, within the BRAF protein, which are uh, drivers of uh, melanoma within approximately half of patients with melanoma. And again, more recently, inhibitors, very targeted inhibitors that have been developed which specifically um, work against these BRAF mutated melanomas. So if you look here, this is from uh, other work published by uh, Wegel et al. And you can see a patient with pretty aggressive disease before treatment. If you look uh, uh, following very early on into treatment with these uh, BRAF inhibitors, you get a very striking response. Now, but the problem is, even though you get this somewhat magical response, in pretty much all cases, you get relapse over time. And again, this is a continuous uh, battle that we're faced with in a, in a cancer setting, is really to uh, uh, continuously offset this resistance phenotype. Another issue to consider is that a lot of the emerging therapies which are being used in the cancer setting are extremely expensive. So again, if you look at this uh, treatment here, uh, this BRAF-specific, uh, mutant BRAF-specific treatment, we're, we're talking about between 50 to um, 60,000 euros or dollars or equivalent over a treatment uh, cycle. Now, personalized medicine we see as, a, as really as a goal, uh, it, it, it's not really just rescuing drugs, but it's also the way that drugs potentially should be developed. Uh, there's a concept that we, we can actually co-develop companion diagnostics along with the actual standard drug development process. And again, one of the drivers behind that is the FDA have a fast track drug approval process where you have a, a drug accompanied by a companion diagnostic. Another uh, driving force is really that the payers are not reimbursing um, uh, 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 unless there is actually demonstrated really a, a concrete effect in terms of improvement, in terms of survival. Now, I've been working in this area of cancer for about two decades, and we particularly focus on cancer biomarkers, uh, particularly in the area of tissue-based biomarkers when a, a cancer pre is presented. But cancer biomarkers can be used really in, in, a, in a lot of different contexts within the oncology setting. So for example, they can be used for early stage, for example, in risk assessment or early detection. But what we're particularly interested in when the disease actually presents with, a, uh, for example, a solid tumor, can we actually look at particular uh, uh, proteins or genes which are expressed within that tissue specimen and actually use that information to determine outcome, but also response to, importantly, response to treatment. Now, if you look at, um, say commercial assays, particularly in the breast cancer setting, there are two assays which I'm going to just briefly talk about, which are pretty well known in the field. 
One is Mammaprint, which is a, a commercial diagnostic produced by a, a Dutch company called Agendia. And they published a key paper in Nature, which I'll refer to later on, uh, just over a decade ago in 2002, where they actually defined a set of 70 genes that could actually be used to predict um, outcome of early, uh, early stage breast cancer patients. What's interesting about this particular signature, it was the first FDA approved multi-index assay uh, approved of its type, it was approved back in 2007. And again, this, is, uh, this particular assay is done in a, a, a focused DNA microarray format. There is a, a, an equivalent type of assay, which is not done in a microarray format, but is done using uh, RT-PCR, which is uh, commercialized by Genomic Health called Oncotype DX. This specific assay is a, uh, a 21 gene signature. There are 16 informative genes and five control genes. What's interesting about this assay is that it's not FDA approved. It's actually run in a, under um, a clear, within a CLIA approved setting. It's a, essentially a laboratory derived test. But there's a, a, very, a, a very significant number of patients which actually have been assessed using this technology across the world. And again, this particular assay is doing something similar to the mammoprint assay. It's predicting chemotherapy benefit within a particular subset of patients, which uh, we were not really sure how to treat early stage breast cancer patients. We know that um, in this sub of patients, we're generally over treating those patients with chemotherapy. Approximately 70 to 80% of those patients don't require chemotherapy, whereas between 20 and 30% of patients do require chemotherapy. And these assays, both Mammoprint and Octite DX, are there really to try to uh, identify low risk and high risk patients in this context. From a kind of health economic perspective, these assays, they range in cost approximately they're around $4,000, around three and a half to $4,000 uh, per assay. And again, there are lots of studies out there really you know, determining whether this, these particular assays are, really provide benefit from a health economic viewpoint. But what's interesting from, from my own national viewpoint, from an Irish viewpoint, was that initially this, uh, for example, the Oncotype DX assay was not uh, uh, given approval for use in uh, public patients. Uh, we have a, a public-private uh, patient process within uh, Ireland. What was interesting, that was, that was changed around very recently such that all patients within Ireland uh, can actually get access to this, tech, uh, tech, this particular technology. The first, uh, uh, it was the first country in Europe in this context. So again, what I would like to do just briefly do is kind of stand back a bit now and just talk a bit more about the biology. So uh, these particular assays, what we're really trying to do is look at the primary tumor, look at the genes which are expressed in the primary tumor to actually predict an event that could happen a number of years down the line. And so on the left-hand side of this image, you can see a, a cartoon of the metastatic process where you get, for example, escape of cancer cells from uh, the primary tumor, can enter into circulation, and, and for example, can go to the secondary sites in terms of metastases. On the right hand side, in a, a, a minute or two, we're just going to show you a movie. And in that movie, you will actually see fluorescently tagged human tumor cells moving through the bloodstream. It's just one aspect of that uh, process. So if you could just play that movie now, please. Okay, so we're back here. So that was just really a movie, which was courtesy of Bob Hoffman from Anti-Cancer Incorporated. And the idea really is just really one aspect of the, this metastatic cascade. So this is really a picture I use really to represent, uh, I suppose, my view of, of cancer. We, we really, and also my weekend within Ireland driving my kids around, but really it's a, we have a pretty good picture of what's going on in the biological setting within cancer. Uh, but the actual detail is missing, and really, um, that's really what I'm going to talk about over the next um, uh, few minutes. So we've, uh, over the last decade or even longer, we've carried out a lot of discovery using various different omic profiling approaches, gene expression profiling, proteomics, etc. 
and really there's um, this discovery, there's a huge uh, uh, discovery process, but the actual conversion of this new knowledge into something that's actually clinically useful is really falling behind. So there's really a, a key problem in terms of validation or tra translation of this information into uh, something that's useful. So one thing that we've tried to do is within a breast cancer setting is we've actually brought together gene expression data from multiple different published studies where we have, from, particularly from DNA micro studies, where we have survival information from those patients. So we've just published this paper just recently in breast cancer research, which is pretty widely used. It's a, it's a freely accessible tool, particularly aimed at the average biologist, which perhaps wouldn't have a huge amount of uh, a clinical biostatistical training or uh, a huge amount of bioinformatic capabilities. And the idea behind this is that is a, we've developed a user-friendly interface to interrogate genes or candidate genes that you think may have some prognostic role within a, a cancer setting or breast cancer setting. And so uh, what our, uh, our bioinformatician in our, in, uh, who uh, carried out this work, he actually integrated data from 26 different data sets uh, from 12 different microarray platforms, essentially over 4,500 samples where we have clinical data and uh, expression information. And again, if you're interested, you can actually uh, look at this web link and you can actually interrogate specific genes of interest. And I'm just gonna give you some examples of what you can actually get from this type of uh, in silico based analyses. And so if you look at some genes, for example, on this Oncotype DX um, uh, panel, some of the 16 genes, you can actually look at the, uh, the, the prognostic utility of those genes across that 4,500 uh, patient set on an individual basis. And so for example, you can look on the top left, you can see the value of KI67, a pretty well known prognostic marker in, in, in cancer. And then some other probably more novel markers, STK15, surviving and MMP11. Uh, uh, and a key thing to emphasize is that really there's a, I suppose there's a, there's a, a key tipping point where if you actually combine, um, you can actually, each of those markers potentially holds value as a prognostic marker in your own setting. But when you actually combine them together, if you actually combine too many genes together, you actually potentially can lose prognostic value. And so this is the this idea that uh, on one level, you may not require all 16 genes from um, informative genes from the uh, Oncotype DX assay. You can potentially reduce that down to three or four genes of interest. And again, it's how you really combine these together as a signature. And again, people you can look at other genes uh, using this resource. So we published a few papers on the application of this piece of software uh, or uh, database called Breastmark. Uh, these are just two highlighted studies. One we published with um, uh, Matthias Mann in Cancer Research uh, just over a year ago. And what Matthias did is he actually carried out uh, a very comprehensive proteomic profiling effort in breast cancer. And he came up with about 55 G proteins, which were differentially expressed during progression in um, uh, breast cancer. And then what we did is we went back and actually looked at the value of these at the only level using this wider clinical resource and showed which of those hold, held value. On the right-hand side, uh, just referring to a paper we published in the first issue of Cancer Discovery with Lisa Cousins' group, and she was interested really in the role of the inflammatory response in breast cancer and how this could impact on a chemotherapy response. And in this case, what we're doing is looking at surrogates of immune cell infiltration by looking at expression of particular markers. I shown there was utility there. So what I'm going to shift really now is really the main part of my talk, which is use of antibody-based proteomics. And if you're interested in this area in a bit more detail, we published a review article in Nature Reviews Cancer over, over two years ago where we kind of reviewed the different, different aspects of antibody-based proteomics. I'm not really going to cover all of those today. So again, as part of our strategy, we integrate data from multiple different platforms. It could be gene expression data, uh, proteomic data, or functional screens. And then we use antibodies in a pretty much high-throughput manner to validate these candidates on additional patient samples. And I'll talk about particularly the, the technology that we use. We use tissue micro technology to look at large numbers of clinical specimens. What I'm not going to talk about today is really the application of reverse phase protein arrays or antibody arrays, but you can actually find other resources for that. Now, a particular aspect of the use of tissue microarrays, which I'll introduce in a minute, is that we were really driven towards the development of automated image analysis tools 
to actually uh, facilitate the quantitation of our data. So if you're, not inter if you're not familiar with what a tissue microarray is, it's really a platform for high throughput uh, pathology where you can, on the left hand side you've got your conventional uh, piece of tumor tissue that a, 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 a surgeon obviously would remove and then hand it over to a pathologist who would fix and form and embed in paraffin and put into a tissue block and then carry out standard full face sectioning on. And so what you can do with a tissue microarray is you can actually take small cores of tissue from each of those blocks, put them into a master block, and then you can actually put hundreds of clinical specimens on a single block. And this is uh, very powerful because you can actually create uh, uh, obviously sections of that tissue microarray and you can look at expression of markers of interest, but importantly within a morphological context. And again, this is a key transition step because a lot of the profiling technologies which I discussed previously, uh, gene expression profiling or proteomics, are essentially mashup technologies where you take a piece of tumor tissue, uh, 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 combine it together, mash it up together, and look at expression of proteins or, or, or genes, but within the entire milieu of the different cell types within that tissue. Whereas within a tissue microarray, you can actually look at expression of those markers within that cellular context. You can also look at DNA alterations, and we've actually published some recent work looking at microRNA alterations within TMAs. So really the power of uh, TMA is really it's a, a, an opportunity to actually transition from this discovery to, to uh, uh, a higher degree of validation, where you can take, for example, candidates which emerge from a gene expression study, a classical gene Sorry, I just had a bit of a problem on. Sorry, I uh, just want to just check if everybody can hear me. Okay, sorry, I just had a bit of a problem. Um, so anyway, I'll just pu push on here. So in terms of um, this idea of one, one, one area that's really uh, revolutionized uh, uh, pathology is the advent of digital pathology, where you can actually create high resolution digital scans of these traditional glass slides which are used by pathologists and this facilitates two uh, activities. One, you, you don't have to share glass slides around to your colleagues, you can actually share the information online and this really greatly facilitates manual assessment of this data. Another area that's very useful is that you can actually start to use computational tools to actually replace some of the kind of, I suppose, uh, cumbersome approaches which are used for, for manual assessment. So for example, you can actually quantify staining or different, different patterns within tissue. And I'm going to talk about that later. Now what I'm going to talk brief, briefly now is really about um, the use of particular biomarkers in breast cancer. And, and specifically this uh, graph or table shows the current FDA approved biomarkers in, in breast cancer. And you can see that really all, all breast cancers are assessed for three proteins fundamentally at the start, which would be the estrogen receptor, its downstream uh, target, the progesterone receptor, and HER2, which is the, obviously the drug target for uh, uh, HER2-based therapies like Herceptin. Now, there are some other markers which people uh, kind of use in, the, in a lesser manner, but are FDA approved. And again, as I mentioned, that you have the mammoprint assay, which was approved back in 2007. And again, the question that these assays really, um, particularly the mammoprint assay and Architect DX assay, ask is can the metastatic and therapeutic potential be predicted by whole tissue analysis of the primary tumor? And what we're talking about really is uh, can we be clairvoyant at the molecular level? Can we predict an event that's going to happen a, a number of years down the line? And as I mentioned, I'm going to talk just in a bit more detail about this kind of seminal study by Laura Van Fier and Rennie Bernards back in Nature in 2002, where they actually looked at uh, um, just under 80 patients uh, where they actually split into two different groups, essentially a good prognosis group, which displayed, uh, uh, or sorry, a poor prognosis group, which is displayed evidence of distant metastasis within five years, and then a good prognosis group, which didn't display this phenotype. And essentially they carried out gene expression profiling, looking at about 25,000 transcripts, and they found 70 genes which could actually predict this event in just over 80% of patients. And that really led to the genesis of mammoprint. What's interesting is that this particular uh, uh, diagnostic assay, which has been commercialized by uh, Agendia, is being te tested in a prospective manner in a very large scale study called MindAct, where they're going to profile essentially 6,000 early stage node negative tumors and really benchmark this new molecular diagnostic versus standard criteria which are used in Europe 
called the St. Gallen criteria. And again, if you, if for example, the traditional criteria and the new molecular diagnostic uh, agree that the patient is low risk, they're not, they're, they're not given chemotherapy. If they agree that they're high risk, they're given chemotherapy. And if they disagree, the patients are randomized. And at the end of the study, which we're, we think that the data will come out sometime next year, we'll actually know which, uh, which assay or which, which type of strategy is the best in terms of prediction. And again, we have a similar type of uh, study ongoing, a prospective study uh, called Taylor X, where uh, which is being carried out worldwide, testing the utility of the Oncotype DX assay, where they're looking at 10,000 patients. Now, a number of years ago, I had the uh, fortune of hosting uh, a Professor Bob Milliken in my lab as a Fulbright scholar, and Bob unfortunately died uh, in October 2012. Uh, uh, but he, he and Chuck Pru really made some key observations or kind of came up with this concept that you could actually potentially mimic the molecular diversity that's seen in breast cancer by using a small panel of uh, traditional and more novel immunotechnical markers. And this may provide a, maybe a more low cost, clinically applicable tool. And so this is indicated here. So Chuck Peru and Trey Sorley uh, a number of years ago actually came up with this concept that you can actually uh, subdivide breast cancer in various different uh, subgroups. For example, luminal A, luminal B, uh, HER2 positive, um, basal-like or normal breast-like based on gene expression data. And these subgroups have prognostic impact in terms of link, links with patient survival. But you can actually represent that, that molecular diversity or these subgroups by using traditional markers like ER, PR, and HER2, and some cytokeratins. And, uh, uh, so you can use a, a, a lower cost tool to actually uh, subdivide patients in this context. And so um, Doug Ross, uh, um, who uh, was a kind of key person in the gene expression field a number of years ago, he set up this company called Applied Genomics, which is, uh, was taken over by uh, Clariant uh, a couple of years ago. And he actually did something that most people don't do in a gene expression-based experiment, where what he did is he actually took a standard uh, uh, large cohort of genes, which are, were outputs of a gene expression experiment, and actually got commercial antibodies against these particular targets, uh, and then used so hundreds of antibodies against these various different targets and then screen those antibodies and uh, totally independent series of patient samples and ask the question, which of those markers which were originally identified at the RNA level translated at the protein level as being useful as prognostic markers? And so Doug actually came up with a panel of five proteins, including P53 and then four more novel markers, when combined together could offer uh, prognostic impact in terms of uh, uh, predicting patient outcome within this particular subset of early stage breast cancer patients, ER positive, and lymph node negative patients. And so we had a similar idea a number of years ago, we actually got funding from the EU for this particular program called Target Breast. And this involved um, uh, my home university, as well as Lund University in Sweden, uh, the Netherlands Cancer Institute, which was where Rennie Bernards is based, as well as Agenda, who was pushing forward Mammaprint and a telepathology company called SlidePath. And the focus of this particular program was really taking omic-based data and then trying to identify candidate genes which were linked with differential outcome in breast cancer and then try to verify these at the protein level. And so our strategy was really to uh, analyze DNA microarray data, uh, come up with candidates, then get antibodies from a particular resource, which I'll talk about in a minute, called a protein atlas, check the specificity of these antibodies using cell culture models where we modify the protein of interest then actually, uh, once we're happy that the antibody is specific, we put it onto a TMA uh, of large number of clinical specimens, and then correlate the staining with, uh, we quantify the staining, and then correlate that uh, expression information with survival. So the particular tissue microarrays we got uh, were, came from a source in Sweden, uh, particularly Joran Lamberg and Karen Jurstrom. And the Swedish are extremely good at collecting uh, this type of clinical material, but also having long-term follow-up uh, on patients, and so, so in some cases we have we have follow-up data for up to 20 years. And these uh, these types of materials also come with a whole variety of other clinical parameter information. And so uh, again, uh, approximately uh, it's probably about seven eight years ago, 
following the various different in-house discovery approaches and other people's papers, we came up with a really a hit list of 250 genes that we thought could be interesting in a breast cancer context, which, which tracked progression in some way. And when we looked for commercial antibodies against these targets, we were pretty um, unsuccessful. And so we submitted a, a list of these 250 targets to a worldwide call by the Human Protein Atlas to generate antibodies. And again, I would encourage people to, if they're not familiar with this, to, to look at this particular website. And so the Human Protein Atlas is really a, a fantastic effort. It's a not-for-profit group uh, based in Sweden where they're generating antibody, antibodies against essentially all proteins, all non-redundant uh, human proteins. And they've pretty much got, I think, half the uh, proteome covered at this point. And you can actually interrogate uh, information online uh, in respect to protein expression and get access to these antibodies. And so what they do is they actually express a pretty big chunk of the protein. They, they, they express a, a large polypeptide from that protein. They uh, generate uh, uh, finitely purified uh, polyclonal uh, uh, antibodies derived from rabbit. Then they're uh, purified, and then you go through a whole range of different specificity assessments where they're screened on protein arrays, they're screened on a whole variety of different normal and uh, cancerous tissue from humans, various different cell lines. So you get a lot of data already uh, in your hands before you get access to the antibody. The process is reasonably lengthy. It takes uh, one to two years. We submitted a list of 250 uh, uh, genes to the, to the program. Uh, 100 were already in other people's programs for antibody production, and 150 were got onto uh, the program specifically for early access for our studies. In terms of success rate, you get about 40% success rate coming, coming through the system. And over the last number of years, we've been actually profiling the expression of, um, or using these antibodies to profile the expression of particular proteins on TMAs. And I'm just going to give you just a brief example of, of the type of data we've generated. So one particular marker called PDZK1, we originally identified uh, as being correlated with a uh, good outcome in a, a gene expression-based data set. Sorry, one second, there's a Q&A up here. Okay, sorry, I'll go back. So there was a, um, we had originally identified as being correlated with uh, a good outcome based on gene expression-based data. An antibody was created against PDZK1 by the protein atlas, and then screened in a totally independent series of patient samples. Now, in this case, you can see on the, on the uh, image that we create, we really use a traditional scoring approach, where we a categorical approach from zero, one plus, two plus, and three plus in terms of staining. And what we see is that the, the use of this uh, marker as a prognostic indicator or an indicator of good outcome also uh, works at a protein level. And so we've just published a paper in BMC Cancer where what we've described is a three marker panel, which is comprised of this uh, PDZK1 protein, which is an indicator of good pro prognosis, as well as two markers of poor prognosis, aniline uh, and PBK. And really, if you combine what I'm showing here is really the, 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 each of those markers on a singular level, where you have on the top panel, you have the gene expression based information for aniline, PBK, and PDZK1 where you can see low aniline correlates with better outcome, high aniline correlates with poor outcome. The same is true for PBK, and then you get an inverted scenario for PDZK1 because it correlates with good prognosis. On the bottom panel, what you're seeing is um, uh, the value of those proteins as prognostic indicators using these newly derived antibodies on a totally independent series of patient samples. And again, they're, they hold their, their value. And again, really what we're trying to do here is really combine these markers together because we want to develop something maybe in a, in a, on a, an alternative to Oncotype DX or Mammoprint that is maybe simpler and maybe more effective. And so what we currently have is a novel threeplex assay. On the left-hand side, you can see the combination of these markers at the RNA level. They're reasonably effective, which at the protein level, they're very strikingly effective where if you've got high PDZK1, low PBK, and low aniline, it's a very good prognostic indicator where you've got the opposite scenario, it's a, it's a poor prognostic indicator. And again, uh, uh, the power of this uh, previous uh, system, which I talked about, called BreastMark, where you have all of this gene expression data integrated, we can actually go back now and look at the expression of those tree markers in that da data set. And so if you ask the question across those 4,500 uh, patient samples, and many of those contained information on gene expression information on those three markers, 
we have essentially about 10 data sets, just over 1,500 patients where we have that type of data. What's interesting, even across these different 10, 10 data sets and different technology platforms, these uh, collection of three markers hold utility uh, as, a, uh, as a signature. So what I'm really going to shift now is to really the use of automated image analysis. So if you look at conventional manual assessment of um, IHC data, it's, it's fraught with problems. We, there's lots of studies showing the subjectivity of manual quantitation. It's very time consuming. There's a lot of variability in terms of uh, data. But really, the pathologist really mean is the kind of gold standard that uh, a lot of uh, even currently used therapeutics like Herceptin, uh, Tamoxifen, a lot of these drugs which are used on day to day with, uh, within the cancer context, really the gatekeeper is the pathologist in terms of the quantitation. With automated image analysis, uh, it's really, really a new tool that a pathologist can use, which can actually try to um, uh, fast track their process, where you can really provide objective quantitation of IHC data. You can get reproducible data, but importantly, you can also get con con continuous output data. And so about five years ago, we reviewed this whole area of automated image analysis in a histopathological context. And it's really a, a massive growth area. Uh, I'm not going to really focus on all of the different aspects today. I'm going to particularly focus on quantitation of bright field images, conventional uh, staining of um, uh, via immunist chemistry. But there are a whole range of different areas of interest, for example, the development of multi multiplex fluorescence-based assays like, like aqua. And so the mainstream application is really, can we develop automated solutions to actually quantify staining of particular proteins? For example, it could be a nuclear protein like ER or a membrane protein like HER2 in an automated manner. And so a, PH, a former PhD student in my lab, Elton Rexapash, he developed a, an intuitive self-learning system, which we have subsequently commercialized uh, into a technology called IHCMARC. And what we're showing here is just an example of this. So if you look at, looking at this image, you see a conventional stain for the estrogen receptor, where you get, on the left-hand side, you've got um, essentially a conventional staining, where you can see the brown, dot, brown dots are essentially cancer cells, nuclei of cancer cells, which are positive for that marker. But what's quite challenging is to find the cancer cells in the background stroma, within the background stroma, which are negative for ER. And so what Elton did is he actually developed a system which actually learned the morphological features of those tumor cells based on the actual cells which are positive for that marker, such that you could actually find the tumor cells within that background stroma which are negative for that marker of interest. And you can see that on the right-hand side, the, the cells which are indicated in blue are the tumor cells which are negative for ER, whereas the cells in red are actually positive for ER. Now, what's the value of this? Well, the value is, is in terms of a clinical decision. So we tested the utility of this particular approach in over 1,000 breast cancer patients across three different clinical cohorts. And what we're showing here is really just a, a comparison um, between the automated data on the y-axis and the manual assessment data. And in this case, we're using a kind of binary cutoff of if you're greater than 10% positive, you're considered ER positive. If you're less than 10% positive, you're considered ER negative. And what you can see here is a pretty good correlation between the manual data and the automated data. But obviously, with the automated data, you get a, a spread of uh, results across three different cohorts. We see the same thing with the uh, uh, other widely used marker, the progesterone receptor, which is kind of a downstream indicator or effector gene of ER. And so what we're really uh, interested in this particular uh, uh, schematic, I'm just looking at one particular clinical cohort. So uh, I'll just go back just a couple of slides because it just describes it here. So one of the cohorts that we used was from a randomized controlled tamoxifen trial, where half the patients approximately received no treatment whatsoever, no systemic therapy, and the other half received tamoxifen. And the benefit of this for two years, the benefit of this is you can actually try to pull out the patients which are ER positive based on image analysis data, and then ask the question, does tamoxifen have a treatment-related effect? Um, and you can do that also for PR. And, and in this case, you can see that there is a, a divergence in terms of survival. And this really shows that you can actually use image analysis uh, tools to quantify a marker that has putative predictive ability. And so what we did is we actually um, packaged up this approach. We actually secured, uh, we've recently secured a US patent and we have an EU patent pending on this approach. 
And really, over the last number of years, we've set about validating this approach across uh, multiple cancer types and also expanding out its utility. So we now have a, a particular tool called IHC Mark, which is a novel uh, a proprietary approach where we can actually quantify immunostochemical staining. We can look at nuclear stains, cytoplasmic stains, and membrane stains. And as again, as I mentioned, we've spent the last number of years publishing a variety of different papers showing the utility of this particular approach across multiple cancer types. We can also do interesting things where we can actually use image analysis data, this continuous data that's derived from this approach, linked with survival information to actually objectively de define new cutoffs uh, and patient subgroups. We've looked at both classical markers and novel markers, but also we've looked at uh, not only quantifying tumor uh, cell markers, but also looking at immune cell infiltrate and other applications. So remember this particular signature that we identified previously that based on manual data worked pretty effectively. We've been actually able to automate this assay now and we get good correlation between the automated data and the manual scores for this particular signature. Our probably most powerful data to date is from a prostate study where uh, 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 our collaborator Anders Bartel from Lund, he'd previously worked, published a study on this particular protein called MSMB and he had used manual assessment on about 500 patients and shown that an inverse association with biochemical recurrence. And then he had gotten access to essentially another 2,500 patient samples and really, uh, really needed a, a, f a faster way of analyzing this uh, huge resource of clinical specimens. And so the first thing we did is we actually compared our um, automated data versus this uh, manual data on the set of 500 patients and then looked at the entire cohorts. And so what we're looking at here is just a kind of a representative image of a, a low expressing sample and a high expressing sample for this particular marker. Uh, what you can see here is a Kaplan-Meier survival plot where we have all uh, essentially 3,000 patients within this study. And we can actually show that using this image analysis acquired data, you can actually show that this protein uh, holds predictive value or uh, in terms of prognostic value. And again, you, and this is another study uh, uh, that was, I mentioned, that was published with Lisa Cousins in Cancer Discovery, the first issue. And what we're doing is something pretty simple here. Uh, there's a big interest now in the cancer field to look at immune cell infiltration and looking at correlations with, with outcome. And what we're simply doing here is using different uh, markers for different inflammatory cells, so CD4 positive cells, CD8 positive cells, or, or looking at macrophage content. And essentially using the power of this image analysis tool to look at uh, density of these immune cells within the entire tumor area and then correlating these density measurements with survival. And depending on the type of immune cell that you have or inflammatory cell or macrophage, this has differential prognostic impact and you can actually combine that as a signature in itself. So I'll just briefly mention Oncomark. Again, I just wanted to indicate that I also had a commercial interest. So I spun out this company a number of years ago, really with the idea that we want to transition some of our discoveries, particularly using this digital pathology-based approach. And so currently Oncomark is still heavily invested in R&D. We're working across a number of different cancer types. We're working breast cancer, prostate, and colorectal cancer specifically. And we're, we're working um, particularly armed with funding from the EU. We have uh, received four and a half million euro in EU funding really are covering these different uh, uh, cancer areas. So what I wanted to do is also talk about a, a new initiative uh, which kind of I, I've recently kind of uh, taken over. It's called Breast Predict. And this is a, a very large research program. It's a, a program essentially encompassing pretty much all the breast cancer researchers or highly active breast cancer researchers within Ireland. And it's the first of a very large scale uh, kind of nationwide initiative in breast cancer. And so we know that, for example, breast cancer is not just one disease. We know that there's a huge amount of diversity between patients. Uh, even if you look at different tumors from uh, different patients, you've got, uh, again, variations in terms of um, molecular characteristics. And again, we have this phenomenon with, of within tumor heterogeneity at a molecular level. And so we've had a lot of advances in biology and a huge amount of information at the molecular level, but we really need now to transition from this is really take this new data to redefine how we treat breast cancer, really with the ultimate goal of precision therapy. We also now need to uh, take on board what's coming out from systems biology, 
in terms of pathway network modeling and build that into the system, identify putative nodes which are kind of driving uh, cancer in a particular way. We need to use this type of data uh, to actually better understand how tumors respond or resist treatment. We also need to get better at actually sampling patients during their course of treatment, particularly uh, sampling patients longitudinally uh, throughout their treatment uh, uh, course. And so this Breast Predict program, which actually started in October of this year, is, uh, it's a five-year research program, um, uh, um, a very large-scale program. We're actually bringing together three different components. We're bringing together uh, uh, translational researchers, which are coming out with discoveries, for example, using molecular profiling with medical oncologists, but also taking a, a population-based perspective of, of, of cancer, particularly breast cancer. And our aspiration is really to combine molecular data, clinical data, but also population-based information within a, a fully unified nationwide database. And then use this information to actually inform uh, what are the most appropriate diagnostics, uh, diagnostics and therapies to use within that patient population. Again, uh, this is a figure which recently came out on a recently published gap analysis in the breast cancer research, uh, breast, within the journal Breast Cancer Research, uh, sponsored by the Breast Cancer Campaign. What we're indicating here is really the, I suppose, the treatment course of an individual uh, or series of individuals with breast cancer. And really what you'd like to do, rather than just sampling the primary tumor, you want to be able to get in there and actually sample like are obtained biological materials from patients throughout their entire treatment uh, course. And particularly one area that's difficult is sampling of metastases, relapse disease. And so we have within this program a particular uh, focus on actually getting access to this disseminated material and then comparing the primary and the corresponding mechs from individuals. The kind of questions we're asking within this program are so the, the kind of programs we're asking uh, within this um, uh, large-scale program is really uh, questions around, uh, for example, we know that uh, patients who take aspirin pre-diagnosis to breast cancer seem to have a differential outcome uh, based on population-based information. What we want to do is really uh, verify this, but also probe this at a mechanistic level. We're interested in actually um, uh, tracking how tumor, tumors change during or evolve over time during treatment, looking at molecular diversity during treatment. But also one uh, aspect that we're focusing on is really there's lots of new and exciting drugs out there in the, in the cancer field, particularly in the breast cancer field, but we're not really sure how to effectively combine these together. Can we come up with a more rational basis for combination? And again, taking on board computational biology and systems medicine approaches. Uh, another program which I'm involved with, which um, kind of refers to this digital pathology area, is called FastPath. And this is a program which is specifically focused on prostate cancer. And this involves essentially two different aspects. We're interested in looking at morphological subgroups within prostate cancer. People might be familiar with Gleason grading, which is the kind of current used uh, approach, which is trying to subdivide prostate cancer into different uh, uh, categories and then correlating that with. Uh, how you treat a patient. We're trying to maybe get around that by using more novel and sophisticated approaches for looking at diversity uh, in terms of morphological subgroups. We're also interested in looking at, again, this image analysis based solution to quantify prognostic biomarkers. What's unique about this program is that we're actually also bringing in a new element, which is high performance computing, because uh, image analysis is all well and good, but without high performance computing, there's a, uh, there's a potential kind of delay effect. So this is a collaboration with um, uh, groups in Northern Ireland with Queen's University Belfast and also a uh, spin-out from, from there called Path Excel. So one last uh, EU program which I'm going to briefly mention is called RAVER and this is a program I, I coordinated. It's about midway in the program. And this is quite an exciting program. What we're doing is we're focusing on two particular subsets of breast cancer which are uh, particularly challenging to treat. So there's a group of uh, approximately 15% of breast cancers, which are called triple negative, where they don't explain expression of the estrogen receptor, PR, or HER2, and therefore aren't really um, kind of hot candidates for targeted therapy. There's also another subgroup, which is about 10% of uh, breast cancer patients, which um, 
are what are called invasive lobular carcinomas. And this is a pretty much understu understudied subgroup of uh, patients. And these patients t generally display a poor response to systemic chemotherapy. And so in this particular program, we're actually focused at looking at kinome alterations within 150 triple negative breast cancers and 150 invasive lobular carcinomas, as well as a series of representative cell lines from those different subgroups. And we're doing a kind of multi-omic approach where we're looking at uh, mutational profiling using kinome capture-based uh, systems. And this is work that's been done in Rene Bernard's lab in the NKI. We're looking at kinase activation using reverse phase protein arrays. This is taking place in the Institute Curie use in, within uh, Thierry Dubois' lab. We're also using a copy number analysis using whole genome uh, uh, SNP arrays to look at uh, whole genome copy number variation, but also specifically zooming in on the kinome alterations. This work is taking place in Carlos Callas's lab in Cambridge. And then finally, we're also taking a, a kind of an RNA-based perspective using both gene expression arrays and RNA sequencing. And this work has been done in Agendia and also in, in my home institution, UCD. What's interesting with this program, we've actually completed the actual discovery part where we've actually obtained the uh, omic data from these different platforms across um, for all of those specimens. And really now we're in the final stages of integrating this information and we hope to get a really a kind of landmark paper initially which really def redefines uh, these particular subgroups of, of breast cancer, particularly invasive lobular breast cancer at a molecular level. The next stage of the program is really take those the discoveries now and start to use it practically. Is there some novel kinase alterations that we can find which are enriched or altered in those particular subgroups of uh, breast cancer that can be used to inform downstream um, stratified medicine trials. And we have funding ring fence within the program for uh, a companion diagnostic trials to actually test that concept. Uh, one, uh, uh, we have an analogous program within the colorectal cancer space where we're looking at a series of, it's called uh, apatocide, and we're, we're actually looking at a, a variety of different markers within the apoptosis signaling pathway and applying a systems medicine approach to quantify the, or to, to model this particular pathway, but using information derived from IHC staining of colorectal cancer specimens uh, to predict chemotherapy response. So what I'd like to do is just finish off by indicating the various different funding sources which have supported this work, particularly the Irish Cancer Society, Enterprise Ireland, the Health Research Board of Ireland, Science Foundation Ireland, and the European Commission. Also, what I'd like to do is thank the various different people which have contributed to this work, particularly uh, national collaborators and international collaborators from Sweden, UK, uh, and the US, and also people on, within my lab, both current members and former members of my group. So I'm happy to take some questions on my, actually, sorry, I, I actually was supposed to um, also indicate that people can obtain continuing education credits, they can actually go to this particular resource. So what I'll do is I might click up the Q&A box and, and maybe go through some of the questions that people may have. Well, I've just got one question. so. If people have other questions, please please feel free to, to ask that. So there's a question which is um, here, can an antibody uh, generated be used in immunotherapy? So what's in the particular focus of our study to uh, in the area of immunotherapy? We were, we were really interested in use of antibodies from the point of view of just conventional antigen de de detection. Um, so we, we didn't go out there with the mission to develop antibodies for therapeutic purposes. So again, I'm happy to take any other questions if people are interested. Okay, I'm still waiting for questions.
Uh, so there's a question here. Have you worked with Optimers to... Uh, no. So we, we I'm, I'm familiar with Optimers, but we, uh, we, I, I, we haven't actually specifically worked with Optimers. Obviously, Optimers can be particularly useful for from a therapeutic context also. So again, if people have any other questions, I'm, 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 I'm happy to take them. Okay, I might, yeah, I might wrap it up actually. Uh, so if I don't, if I don't get another question in the next minute, I'm going to wrap it up. So um, thanks very much for everybody who has listened to me. I really appreciate that, and uh, I think we got about between 70 to 80 uh, uh, attendees. Okay, there's a question here. Okay, is there a specific biomarker for brain cancer which can be detected using antibodies? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I'm sure there are lots of candidate biomarkers which are kind of being postulated as being useful uh, for, for brain cancer. It depends what kind of application. Is it something that you're looking for, something that is exclusively expressed in brain cancerous tissue, or are you looking at specific markers that can be used for predicting outcome? So I certainly would suggest you look up the um, Protein Atlas resource, and then you can, you can actually potentially screen for markers. I'm pretty sure that they have uh, brain cancer material there which are uh, represented on their resources. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now. So thanks very much. Don, do you want to close down there? <laughs>